Now we're starting to come down to the home stretch here. Okay, a couple more sections we need to do. Um, in this section, we're going to talk about the data and results analysis tool. So now what we've done is we've gotten the tools to come up with solutions, and some of the tools are actually, you know, they can pass or fail. But other ones are just going to come out with answers. And so we have to decide whether those answers are good or not. And so that's where we can start using the data and the uh, results analysis tools. So we're going to uh, configure um, a data analysis tool as well as a results analysis tool. Now the results analysis tool, I'm actually going to hold off until we do inspection designer, which is in this section as well. But I'm going to do the data analysis tool first. Then I'm going to go into inspection designer for two reasons. One, it's broke in 7.2. And two, <laughs> um, uh, because it is kind of a more advanced topic. So I want to make sure that we concentrate on it, not just like cram them all together, because it is a little bit different. So the data analysis tool is really just limit checking. Okay. So you're going to have a value come in, and you're going to decide whether it should be warning, either high or low, or reject, high or low. So you're going to be setting your limits with this. It's also going to be able to get aggregate stats about the tool. So you're going to say, well, how many of the recent uh, results coming back of it am I keeping track of so I can have some type of statistical information about it? So whenever you're doing the data analysis tool, you can add a new item to it. So you would give it a name. You then have to go add that terminal. Unfortunately, this is one of those tools that doesn't add the terminal for you. So you're going to have to add the terminal to it and then feed it from someplace inside your program with what that value should be. The value will then show up here, and then it's just a matter of setting, do you want, you know, what do you want it to reject, whether you want it to reject a low, whether you want it to warn a low, warn a high, or reject a high. And also, there's one more over here, whether you have a specific nominal value, it should be, and that you're just checking whether it's the nominal value. So like I said, when you add one of those parameters in there, you have to go into the add terminals and add that particular terminal out so that you can grab it. So you want to go underneath. Uh, usually you can deal with just typical with this. And it's just a matter of when you look underneath it, you're going to have your results or your parameters here. And it's going to tell you what you had named it. And underneath it, in particular, you want to grab what the current value is. That current value you want to add as an input. Because that's where you want to feed this other value into it so that you're checking what that, that limit is, that value is. So now after you feed that information into your terminal, like I said, it's going to show up as value, which then you can go through and set what should your different limits be. So what it's going to do is it's going to take a look at all your settings inside your data analysis tool, all the different um, parameters that you're looking at. And it's going to give you a acceptance or reject depending on whatever the lowest is. And what I mean by the lowest means that if you fail, it fails. If your lowest is a warn, then you're only warn. And if nothing fails or warns, then of course you pass. Okay. It gets a little tricky setting it up. Okay. When you're setting the limits, it's up to, not up to and including. What do I mean by that? It'll get you on the count. Okay. So kind of think of these as, you know, that we're looking at less than. But it's not less than an equal, notice. So if I'm trying to count only three of my LEDs, my low limit would be three. My upper limit would be four. Now you would think that means nothing would ever pass. But remember, it's up to, not up to and including. So the fact that I say three there it means anything up to three would be a failure. As soon as I hit three, then that, that's my next level. Okay, so it throws you off. It's a little anti-intuitive there. Run into it a couple of times, but it's just something you have to be careful about. Uh, then inside the results tab, it's going to give you information about, you know, you can say, well, how many statistics do you want to buffer? Um, it'll tell you how many is already buffered. And you can also state whether you want it to reject if the channels are not updated. Why might you want to choose this? If the tool doesn't run, then that means what's sitting inside the data analysis tool is what? Old data, bogus data. So basically you're saying, hey, if I haven't run, nope, this fails. I don't even want to take a chance that I, I have bad data here. So you're forcing that tools have to run for it to accept it.
So you'll notice that it will tell you what the aggregate amount is. It will also tell you how many were passes, how many were warrants, how many were rejects, and how many were invalid. And it actually gives you the information about each of the channels that you've posted, as well as your statistical information, up to the amount of buffered results that you had asked for. So that's the data analysis tool. Then we have the results analysis tool. Now the results analysis tool allows for us to be able to set up some type of group of criteria or a group of tests that's going to decide whether we are accepting, warning, or rejecting our results. Not all three. You choose one of the three. So you can only come up with one answer. So with your output, the final part of a a results analysis tool, you're saying, okay, what's your output going to be? And that's where you can choose what your argument should be, whether it's going to accept it or not. Now, let me just hold this off for a moment because it ends up being a little bit, once again, counterintuitive. I must have said, when I was first learning the data analysis and results analysis tool, I sat there and I'm like, why? You know, I don't quite understand all of this. You can use the results analysis tool as a data analysis tool, but it's meant to do more than that. One of the things that the results analysis tool can deal with is it can deal with numeric strings, um, it, numeric values, strings, booleans, as well as vectors. Your data analysis tool is just doing limits. That's all that it's doing. So now you can start getting into more rules of what's going in there. Now some of the things that it can do is arithmetic op, um, calculations, it can do string comparisons, it can do some unary operators. So it has a whole host of different things that it can do. And then you can also add it as an output. Now be careful with this. Adding it as an output is just the value whether it's true or false. Not if you've actually done a calculation. Okay, I've tried this before because I thought, hey, let me turn that radians to pi. I can do the calculations right there and then that would output it. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. It just says that I successfully ran the, the calculations. If you actually want to do the calculations, we're going to do that in scripting, which I'll show you tomorrow. Now, when you're setting up your input terminals, you need to decide, well, what type is it going to be? Is it going to be a function? So you're going to do something like, you know, I'm going to take a value, times it by pi, and I'm going to get some type of result out of it. Or do I want to bring in a single parameter? Okay? So the single parameter might be just the count from my blob tool. How many blobs did I find? Or do I want it to be an array? So maybe I want it to be an array of the blobs that it found, because maybe I want to look at the areas of all the blobs that I was dealing with, and I just want to take a look at what the areas are. So I want to bring in the whole array of blobs and then sort through their areas. So when you're setting it up, so here I've brought in a single variable, can call it whatever I want, and then I'm bringing an expression. So with my expression, the first thing that I have to do is I have to say what operator I want to use. So I have a pull down list and I um, choose what do I want to do. And so in this case, I'm just going to say equal. So if I say equal, then I can go back to argument zero and I say, well, what do I want it to equal? So right now I'll have any of my inputs that I've created or my output itself. Okay, because the results analysis tool always has an output. So I might choose input A, you know, because that's a value I've just brought into the tool. And then what do I want it to equal? So it's also going to show any inputs I have, or I can actually type a value in here. So I might type a value of 3 in here. So it's going to check to see if my input A is going to be equal to 3. If it is, it will be true. If it's not, it's going to be false. So what it's going to do is it's going to go through all your functions, and it's going to resolve them. And they're be being treated as AND functions, all of them. All of these need to be ANDed to each other for the final result here. So as we come down here saying, hey, does my holes equal 2? Do I have some reverse logic, the fact that I don't have holes found? Am I making sure the distance between the holes is between 50 and 60? So first thing I do is I make sure does it meet my range, and do I make sure that it meets my requirements? And as long as it meets my requirements, I'm going to reject if it meets my requirements right there. So I can choose what do I want it to do when a certain function happens. If you leave it by default, it's going to be set as a static value. It's one of those things that it, it throws you off a bit setting this tool up. I know you're shaking your head. It, it's going to take trying first. It's one of those things that you really need to see what's going on. Then it makes more sense, because just being told to you, you're like, ugh, 
Like I said, I'm going to get into the results analysis tool as I cover the actual uh, inspection designer, okay? Because it requires a results analysis tool to work. Now, let's say that we just wanted to check any of our PatMax scores that are going to be above 0.8. So the first thing that we want to do is we're going to bring in the array of PatMax results. Okay, so that brings in, let's say we were looking for five. So it brings in five potential PatMax results. Then what it's going to do is it's only going to take the scores out of it. So it has a whole array of all the results that comes back from PatMax, and it says I'm only looking at the scores. So that's going to be assigned to my PM Align scores right here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look through those and only pull out the ones that are greater than 8.8. .8. So any of them that are greater than 0.8 will still be living at this point. And then finally what I want to do is I want to see what those actual results were that were greater than 8. So we have all the results coming in, takes a look at all the scores, says that, hey, two of them passed, one of them failed, so then it only brings me back just those two results that passed. Because then maybe I can then go down into them, dig them back out, and say, okay, those are the, the actual um, X and Y values that I want from them, only the ones that are above 0.8. This is just a way to kind of sort through it. You notice there was no other logic in QuickBuild, didn't you? Either tools passed or they failed. This is how you start getting logic into it, other than scripting. So now, why would you use one over the other? Well, both are decision-making tools, OK? Your data analysis tool is just tolerance ranges. That's all that it is. It's a numerical value going into it that you're checking the tolerance. That's all that it is. While the results analysis tool, even though you can do a tolerance range on it, it can do so much more. It can do logic. It can do string compares. Um, it is basing a set of rules and checking to see, are you passing your rules for it to decide whether it's good or not? So it's that one step more than just a basic data analysis tool. So your data analysis tools allows for you to look at tolerances, and it allows for you to set whether a value is going to be passed, warned, or reject, while the results analysis tool is going to be looking at a set of rules, and that's what it's checking out. Um, and that's how it's going to give you back your result. I'm going to uh, bring back my other program. So let me go ahead and say file open. Um, I'm looking at my desktop. Save the day one VPC file. Don't save the current application. Um, if I wanted to save the color, I would. I'm not going back to the color at any time, so I'm just letting that go. So if I open this up and run it, Beautiful. This is where it should be. OK. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out some values. Now, I believe inside the lab they have you pull out about seven different values. I figure I'll pull out about three or so, show you guys how to do it. If you guys want to push it to all of them, that's great. But I'm just going to show you about three, because I think that will give you an idea of what's going on. So I'm going to come on down here to the bottom, and I'm going to add um, a data analysis tool. And let me just drop that into my application. And I'm going to open it up, because you'll notice there's no image with it. That's because it's not dealing with images. It's not a vision tool. It's just an analysis tool. So by default, it has this channel 0. I'm not going to use channel 0. Instead, I'm going to write what I'm looking for. So I might check for the PM score. Okay, Just make sure it's over a certain value. Even though I'm allowing over 0.5, maybe I don't want to trust anything that's not at least 0.8. Then I'm going to add another one. Another thing I might want to be looking for is what? Maybe get that um, the caliper length. Let's get that calibrated length of our camera body. So cam body length. OK. And what's another one someone might want? What else do you think I might want to take a look for? Sure, let's get the rotation. Now, we're not going to be able to get the angle. It's going to be the radiance. I'll tell you that right now. Because tomorrow we're going to do a scripting to get the angle. But yeah, we can look, take a look at that. Let's bring in the, um, the angle measurement. Okay. So what I've done is I've just created 
three of them. And notice that I've come off of the last one. Don't just start typing and then leave it there. You've got to come off of it so it accepts it as a name here, okay? Then what I want to do is I want to connect some values to it because right now I don't have any values coming into it. So let me go ahead and get some values connected to it. So notice that it only gave me channel zero right here. We're, this isn't even valid anymore because I don't even have something called channel zero. So I'm just going to, well, I'm going to leave it for just a moment because I want to make sure I'm grabbing the right connection for the other ones. Okay? This at least shows me what it should look like. So when I go to my COG data analysis tool, I'm going to open it, say add terminals, and then what I want to take a look at is my run params. Now notice it gave me a PM score, a CAM body length, and an angle measurement. So if I open up the PM score, I have a current value. Yep, that's this current value. Yeah, that must be the same one. So I'm going to go ahead and add it as an input. Perfect. Yep, that looks like that's the one that it should be. I'm going to do the same, go underneath CAM body length, say current value, add it as an input. Okay. And then underneath angle measurement. I'm going to say current value, add it as an input. How did you do current? What did I just add terminal? Mm -hmm. Yep, I just went underneath run params. And so any of the channels that you've created will now be shown underneath your run params. And all I'm in is typical. And then you brought in? I brought in the current value of PM score, the current value of CAM body length, and the current value of angle measurement. So now I can go in there for channel zero, I can just delete it because it doesn't exist. It's just bogus out there. I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of it. So now I've got to start attaching some things to it. So my PM score, I can right click it and say link from and I have a ton of different stuff. Okay. So I can either go up there and look for my PM align tool and bring it down or what I'm going to do is I happen to know it's PM align tool one and it's item zero from it, it's the score. So I'm going to link it to the score. Okay. Now the body length. Okay. So if I open that up, link from, and that would have been my caliper 2 tool, not my caliper 1 because my caliper 1 was counting the lens lines. Caliper 2 was the calibrated one. But notice that if I look, there's nothing about width here. That's because it doesn't automatically give you the terminal for width. So what I need to do is I need to go find that caliper tool. So this would be my caliper tool 2 that did the calibration. And I'm going to add terminals where inside my results I want it to output my width. So there's my width right there. I'm going to add it as an output terminal. So now I can use that to feed down into my body length. Okay. And then the final one is my angle measurement. I'm going to link from, and this one be a cog angle, line line tools, the angle coming from it. Now if you can read through it, otherwise you can grab it and pull down. And so now everything is in there. So inside my data analysis tool, notice it's registering everything. Okay. Now for reject low, for my PatMax score, Maybe I want it to reject if it's lower than a 0.8. Okay, I need it to be at least a B or higher. Maybe I want it to warn me if it just goes below 0.9. Okay, I know that it's starting to go, you know, halfway to low. You know, it's not perfect. Now, warn high, I'm going to leave these default. Why do I leave them default? Can't do better than 100. So why even bother to put something up there? Now my camera length, the body length, okay? We might say ideal is 4.6 or 4.5, plus or minus, um, t let's say plus or minus 5% uh, would be a plus or minus 0.25 change, like two, five, um, two fifths of a millimeter or something, or sorry, it'd be 25 one hundredths, so a quarter of a millimeter, yeah. Boy, I'm going back and forth here. Um, so maybe my low, I might want that to be uh, maybe 44, make it easy. My worn might be 44.5. My high might be 46.5. And my reject 
might be at 47. So I'm able to put in whatever numbers I want, setting up warnings and rejects. <coughs> and then my angle measurement. Remember, it's going to be in radians. Okay? So my ideal one right now is 1.5. Um, I think it's just going to go lower than this. So what I might say is my reject low might be 1.4, and maybe my reject high is going to be 1.6. Just coming up with some numbers here. Okay. Notice I didn't put any warnings in there. Do I have to? No. No. My choice. Whatever I want to do. So I'm just going to leave it like that. So notice if I run it once and everything, it says it's, it's run here, but it says that I have some rejects here. <coughs> now you might say, well, where am I getting my rejects from? Well, if you take a look at it, it's because I didn't update anything. Well, I ran the tool, why, why is it giving me rejects? Remember, if I run the tool, I'm not running the tool group. I'm only having it take a look at the values again. It knows that it was the same values right before it, so these weren't updated values. So if I go ahead and run the whole tool group, notice now it gives me a pass. It gives me a pass on each one of those. So let me go ahead, let it run for a while. Maybe move it around. See if I can mess something up here. Yeah, there we go. Notice that I can cause some problems here. <coughs> I'm sorry, what, uh, how do I use the value from? Uh, when well, we created that uh, calibration toolbox, yeah. Let's say we wanted to reference one of the tools that's inside there. Uh, it would need to be brought out as a terminal. So you would just need to, within your tool block itself, add another output and tie that value into it so it can come out of the tool block. All that I did is I did my caliper outside of it. I didn't put my caliper tool in it. I did it outside of it. So the tool block itself was a calibration routine, and then any tools that want to use the calibration routine would then connect to the calib image. Right. right. Did you put the, your caliper within the tool block? No, I just, I, I had an angle tool in OK, you just need to bring another output so it knows to come out. That's all. So you would bring it as a double, yeah, and then tie angle to it, because I believe angle is a double. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, angle is a double right there. So now since it's its own tool, notice that even though your other tools might pass, this itself can fail. So if it fails, it makes your whole tool group fail. Okay? Because it's acting like another group. Notice that um, if I get a little slash there, that means it successfully ran, but, and it even shows when it's a warning, but notice how the lower left-hand corner of that also reflects whatever my results are. We're going to see this more so when we start going to the, uh, the application wizard. So, where does the overall result, if we have these individual results, mm -hmm. Well, if you got to pass, 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 what? If you got to pass, 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 the aggregate, you have your result is the aggregate. And it's the aggregate result which controls the result of the data analysis tool, which then controls the tool group. Okay, now if I turn one off that I'm not limited to, I'm still getting a reject, even though back at the settings, there's nothing there. Is there something that if I, I have one, but I don't want to utilize it, a way I can take it out. Did you remove all your settings from here? At the settings level, I unclicked everything. It still exists, but it, it has no settings. Okay, that, that should be enough to let it still pass, because it's not 
You're not rejecting, you're not warning, you're not low. Like if I had deselected everything, then there's really no way that I'm making it uh, fail unless my group fails. And I have pitch indicate values are not updated. Ah, did you go back and change that object manager thing again? The bind on tool, abort uh, on tool failure? Because what's going to happen is it's not going to run the data analysis tool if it's not, if if it's looking, if your failure has occurred ahead of it, then, and it's looking at that value, it's not going to run it. So you set it to false? So that should be fine then. If I don't have anything connected to that one value, then that's why. That it's just saying it's a zero? And so it's saying it is a zero, then yes. And I have no reject warnings. No, if you have it deselected, it still shouldn't. Yeah, so the tolerance data comes back reject, so the two rules that our neighbor has had. But it's the tool running. It's the tool that it's looking at running. Because if it's contingent upon another school that, um, tool that failed, and though it will keep running down, it still won't run any tools if that original tool failed. If anything's connected to it, those can't run. So that's why when PatMax fails, it kills the fixture tool and none of the other, the other tools run. Everything, nothing has failed up in there. And the pin that has nothing on it has nothing on it. In my data, I have a connection. I'll oh, have a high. Because okay. it's definitely finding a data binding issue if PatMax doesn't run. So I've got a pass pass. I'm going back here. So there's nothing sitting on, you said that pin? That might be why, because it's not attached to anything. So when you're saying that reject if the channels aren't updated, there's nothing ever updating from it. And so you're not gauging it against anything, but now it's passing. Because it knows that it has an active value coming in, not just a null so value. You can't actually disable it this way. Well, you, you disable it, but it still needs to be linked to something. Hmm, okay. So always got to be looking at something so it has results. Otherwise, even it's just a null not, result sitting there. Even if it's not making decisions. Even if it's not making decisions, yeah. Oh. It's seeing that because you've selected in your settings to reject um, mm -hmm. if the values aren't updated. Now, there's a couple more things that I want to do to this before I'm ready to say thank you to this lab, OK? And that is, I've brought out these values, but I am going to look at these values later when I do my application wizard. So what I want to do is I want to bring this out to the upper level. And there's an easy way to do this. Okay. All these values are sitting right here. If I right click and I say add to posted items, it will bring that value up so that I can use it later in my application wizard. So if we take a look, let me just minimize my job and take a look at my posted items. Right now, it's showing me that it's brought what's sitting at my PM score, the current value, it's brought it up to um, be a posted item. If I go to this job, and I also grab the camera body length, sorry, I want to add to posted items, as well as angle measurement, add to posted items. I can now go back up there, take a look at my posted items. Now I can see all three of them are added there. If there's anything else you want to bring out, all you need to do is just go to what you care about. So let's say the count of how many defects I have. I can also do it right from there, my count, add to posted items. So if I take a look at my posted items, once again, now I'm actually getting from my blobs, from the defect blob, how many is there. Okay, So that's bringing it up so that I'm going to be able to use it later inside my application wizard. And I definitely want to do that. Otherwise, I will be frustrated later. Do you want me to show you the inspection designer? The inspection designer is a way that you can have a series of images. Okay. Um, and that you can have, 
In the beginning of an application, you would normally create the application starting with a tool block. So everything that we've done up to now, we would normally put inside a tool block. Then what happens is, uh, because it's in a tool block, it can be attached to a set of images where it tests the images. You go in and you state whether the images are good and bad, and you can state what's the problem with them, like what's the defect on each one of them, so that there's some way for the customer and the system integrator to kind of agree what's going on with these images. Okay? So you have this set of images, and then you test it through your current program, and it's going to tell you whether you, the bad images were bad and the good images were good. Because we already did the IDB the first day, so we have some images there. Uh, there could be one hiccup in there, and that's the fact that we don't find what I'm looking for. Um, there's another way you have to go about it. But I think it'll at least show you what's going on. So before you do anything, make sure that you've done, brought these out to posted items. Like I said, otherwise it's going to make your life much more difficult uh, when we do the, uh, the application wizard. So what I'm going to do is, like I said, normally you would start the program with a tool block and everything inside it. Since we didn't do that, I'm not going to go back and, and start that back over. I'm just going to create a little small little section. Okay? It'll give you an idea, a little small subsection. So I'm still going to add a tool block. So I'm going to go up to my tool chest, grab the tool block, and drop that into the bottom here. Okay. Now, a default, whenever you add your inputs and outputs, the input type has to be of type the cog image 8 gray, and it has to be called input image, okay? Capital I, little n, p, u, t, capital I, little m, a, g, e. It has to be named that. If it is not named this, it will not work. Don't you love those ones that have to be so specific? This is going to be a cog image, a 8 gray, yep. And it's going to be called input image. Has to be named that. Okay. Then, just so that I can get things set up, I'm going to go ahead and um, take that input image and I'm going to link it to my actual source image. That's just so that I have something coming in here so I can set up my tools. Otherwise, I have no input image. I just went down to my cog tool block down here. And I just referenced it to the source image. Yeah. Yep, yeah, to the source. Yep, yeah, just so I have a live image there. And notice I have an image coming in. Okay. When I end up linking it to my image database, that'll be fine, but I've got to at least create my tools right now. So what I'm going to do for a tool is I'm just going to do a PatMax tool. Very simple. So I'm going to say PatMax Align tool. My input image is going to be the input image that I've just brought into this tool group. I'm going to run that once. And what I'm going to do is it's going to be as simple as grab my train image and I'm going to put it around the word pass. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and center my origin and I'm going to train it. Okay. So it's going to try to find it. All I'm going to do is try to find whether it has the word pass there or not. That's all that I care about. Now, in order for this to work correctly, um, for the inspection designer to work correctly, I also need to add an results analysis tool because the inspection designer looks at the results analysis tool to be the result of the tool block. So let me go ahead, go into the, my toolbox, grab the COG results analysis tool, and drop this in. Now, inside my results analysis tool, I need to bring in some type of rule of what I'm looking for. And in this case, I'm just going to make sure that perhaps that my score is above a certain number. You know? So first thing I've got to bring in is just an input. So I'm going to call this um, pass score. Okay. Now, notice with this, with adult, uh, the results analysis tool, it automatically gives us that input. Don't you love it? Data analysis doesn't. Results analysis does. So all that I'm going to do with this is I'm just going to link it to my score coming from my PM Align. And I'm going to run it once. Okay. So you'll notice inside my results analysis tool, it's showing this value. Then what I want to do is I want to do a function. 
So I'm going to insert a function, and the function's going, I might call it check score. Okay. And I'm just going to see if something is greater than or equal to. So the argument zero is going to be I'm looking for my pass score. Is it greater than or equal to 0.85 maybe? Making sure it's good? Sound pretty straightforward? Sure. Lost, lost you where? Uh, I brought in the value. Oh, you've got to start with the operator first. So you've got to pull down, grab your operator first. So I said greater than or equal. Then with my argument, my argument says, well, what argument do you care about? I care about my pass score, the score coming in. And then what do I want it greater than or equal to? In this case, I typed it typed it in. Okay. So right now it's telling me that that is indeed true. Okay. Then for my output, right now my output just says except if true. That just means my results analysis tool ran. What I might want to do is except if check score. Okay. Now it's checking to see if check score is true. So if check score is true, then it's going to say, yep, yeah, I've accepted it. If it's not true, it's going to say, no, I don't accept it. Okay? Pretty straightforward, basic results analysis tool. So far, so good? Okay. Those are the basic components that you need in this. So my basic components was an input that says input image, some type of vision tools, and a COG results analysis tool. Now what we can do is we can connect up the database that we want to use. So in order to use the inspection designer, I'm going to click on this thing that looks like, I don't know, big old barrel type thing with a check mark. Um, I think it's supposed to be like different disk, like some type of server pack. Um, so I'm going to connect on that. And then I need to bring in what input database I want to use. So if I click on the database, it says, well, where are you pulling it from? It's going to be pulling from the desktop. Now, notice it's not, mine's not written there. OK? That's because Diana, remember, is sitting up at the desktop. This was the one that we just did yesterday morning. So Diana's sitting up there at the desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And then the next thing that I have to do is to actually go in and edit the database. So if I edit the database, right now it says, well, you haven't referenced a particular database. So in order to bring those images in, now when I click on it, it looks at that root that I just gave it, the desktop. I'm going to grab Diana, say open. And now they said, OK, for all my results coming in, all my images, what do you want the default result to be? Probably not except. <laughs> so it's probably best if I say unknown. And I can also go in and state what my grade is. Now the grade is just saying if there's a particular defect that I want it associated with. I haven't said any of that yet. So I just want them to all come in as unknown. So if I say OK, it sees my seven images. And now I can go through and see which one's which. So this one right now, this is a pass. So I'm going to say this would be an accept. OK? So my next one, this might be an accept. So I might end up saying, OK, I'm going to perhaps give this, uh, let's call this, um, partially occluded. Um, where is it? Uh, um, finger. I'm trying to, they've changed this just a little bit. So let me just add, OK. Uh, OK. So I should be able to, I'm trying to think, I, oh, there's my defect. Um, if I put my, my area over here, I can say this is my defect here. I'm going to say that it's finger, you know, that type of, you know, whatever grading. I guess I could say that this is, you know, A or B or something about my finger. And I could say uh, image partially obscured. Um, 
Now, I really, I don't know what this is going to come up to as far as a number, but uh, let's say that we think it should be not good, okay? So that when I'm telling my system integrator, I'm going to say, yeah, it might come out there, but I don't, if a finger's kind of hitting there, that, that shouldn't be a good image, you know? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say reject here. Go to the next one. This one should be a reject as well. Go to the next one. This one will be an accept. This one will be a reject. Um, I could put my defect right here so I can say um, does not say pass. So notice that I can make some annotations here so that people know what's going on with it. Uh, same thing, reject and reject. Okay. So I've stated what all my images should be so far. So far so good? Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to run it. So when I run it, this be, ah, that's, that I remember. Okay. This is where the bug is. This is where it hit me wrong. Um, the bug is actually in the case of, let me just go back from my verification here. Let me go into my input output. Instead of it being cog image 8 gray, what it needs to be, and let me just delete this, that um, say yes, add it. Um, the, the problem is it just needs to be an ICOG image. They've corrected it again. I forgot about that. They corrected it in 8.2, um, where it goes back to being 8 gray, but otherwise it's a problem there. Okay, there we go. Just connect that back up again. And just... Okay, so let's go back and get this running. It already has my database, and it runs it. Okay, so what it's done is it's gone through and it's put my image in there. Okay, so as I cycle through them, you can see what's going on here. Okay, so right now, the fact that it says match, you know, yes, it did see that this should be good. It did see that this was a bad image. Okay, and if I wanted to, what I could do is I can push it into Vision Pro. So now when I take a look at that, inside my tool block, notice my score here is actually 0.68, so that's why it was indeed failing on me. Okay, uh, this one was indeed still failing. This one was a pass. This one was a fail. Now here's where it starts getting kind of fun. This one was a fail if I push it in. Notice that Pat Max still finds something but at a very low score. Okay, Wasn't what we said it should be, just find, finds it at a very low score. Now you notice when I get to the other ones, let's pull this back up, if I push it in, doesn't find it at all. So you might say, how can I get around finding it? If it's showing, I can actually do a little trick right here, where if I go to my run parameters, I can make my run parameters down to about 0.2, run it, and it should still try to take a look at it. It says result was discarded due to contrast threshold. So let's take a look at our, our, our run params, take a look at what our contrast is, Maybe move this down to four, run it again. Uh, still saying proximity to three other results. Uh, let's just move this down to maybe point 0.1. And it finds something bogus. You know, notice it's finding it over there, but the fact is, is that we've gotten Pat Max to try to run. Absolutely bogus. Definitely the results and, um, analysis tool kicks it out, but it allows for us to have this successfully run the way that it should. So if I run through here, then you'll notice that all my images match what I said they should match. If I go to my statistics, it's saying that I have two true accepts, five true rejects. So they match what I had stated them to be. Kind of cool, kind of, do you see where it can be a little confusing? But neat. 
So they've brought this out so that system integrators can commune with their customers more easily, as well as hooking a database in so you can quickly see how many good, how many bad, without setting up your own reject mechanism. They lost them? Well, yeah, and without it being inside the book, there's so many different turns and everything in there. I remember the first time I had it, what bit me was input image. You know, I didn't have that. I said input. And he goes, well, does it say input image? I'm like, well, it says image. No, it has to say exactly input image. I'm like, well, that's stupid. And then, of course, they had that little bug about it that in 7.2 that it has to be an, um, an ICOG image, not image 8 gray. But they fixed that. That is fixed.